Should I be looking at the chat on on this screen or on the Twitter one, on the other one, the the normal one? I don't know where to look for chat. I can just try both. Okay. On here. Okay, great. Gotcha. Okay, gotcha. Cool. All good. All right, I'm ready to go then. And I will pull up my chart. Apologies, guys. I haven't been through the... Okay, cool. We can start now. Okay, great. All right, I will minimize the screen and I am ready to go then. Three, two, one, and action. So first of all, thanks for spending time here today. You're obviously here at the Naked Trading Webinar. My name is Walter Peters, and I wrote the book Naked Forex. And we're going to talk about some psychology today. So what's interesting is I, um, I think a lot about trading psychology as a full-time trader and someone who did a PhD in, in, in psychology. It's something that's important to me. And I think that it's probably one of those things for most traders that we don't actually get that involved in it until you reach a certain level of maturity as a trader. So in the beginning, you might realize, for example, that, wow, if I just did everything the opposite, then my trades would go most, so much better. But really, um, what ends up happening in the end is more along the lines of something like, well, I realize that the real gains I'm making as a trader end up from working on my psychology. And so that's why today we're going to talk about three different um, mistakes that we often make as traders and I'll also give you the solutions for these now this is no by by no means this is a an exhaustive list or anything like that there are there are many other issues that in, are, involve trading and involve Forex traders in particular that are difficult to overcome but what I'm trying to give you is an, an idea and get you kind of rolling if this is an area that you've been thinking a lot about it probably means that you've been trading for a long time um, like I said, most of the time, the, the, the novice traders don't consider this as much, whereas the more advanced traders who are, and those of you watching this recording and are here today live, uh, obviously most of you are watching the recording, thank you for, the, for your time, you probably don't need me to tell you that when it comes down to it, consistent profitable trading is really all about your psychology. It really is. And there are many things that you can do to number one, realize the psychological mistakes that you're prone to, and two, to overcome them. So let's get into it, shall we? The first thing that I want to talk about here is the recency bias. Now, is everyone here familiar with the recency bias? Oh yeah, and I should mention at the end of this webinar, I'm happy to go over the charts from a from a naked point of view. We can look at any of the markets that you are interested in, any of the markets, any of the time frames. But um, right now, we'll just go over the three, the three psychology mistakes that I want to talk about. So the first one is the recency bias. So the recency bias is when, does anybody know what it is, by the way? Any, any uh, comments on that? Just, just curious. What is the recency bias? Recency bias is when you are um, overweighting the recent moves. As a trader, it's the, the recent moves or the recent um, trades that you've taken. So for example, a good example is in a bubble. When, there, when there's a bubble and the market's in a, in a, um, in a one direction tear and just off on, at, on the races, it's just taking off. What people will say is, things like well if we had bought last year then we would have made x percent so you know if we don't buy this year we're gonna we're gonna miss out that sort of thing and the reason why they say that is they're not looking at the long-term perspective instead they're looking at the short term instead they're looking at the recent moves and they're overweighting those recent moves and assuming in essence the underlying assumption that's not spoken is that what's happened today recently, this year, this week, whatever the time frame that, that they're looking at, that's going to continue on to the future. 
and this is the this is the problem with linear regression. <laughs> when we draw, when we make a linear regression with data. What do we? And I'm, this is the st statistician sort of seeping into this. But when we run with a linear regression, what we're trying to do is make the data fit a straight line, and we do that psychologically. The way we think, we think, it, it, you know, if this market has gone up so much over the last two years, then look at where it's going to go in the next ten years. It'll never come back. And that's a really common thought because we're overweighting the recent moves and we're assuming that it's going to continue on forever. Now, any look at the charts obviously tells you that this is not the case, right? You can look at anything. You can look at anything from oil to uh, the euro. In fact, remember when the euro first came out, all it, all it ever really did was go down. So recency bias means that you're looking at something and you're overweighting something that's happening right now or recently. Now, this is not the way the casinos think. If you think about a casino, casino doesn't really worry if today or this week or yesterday they lost money. It's okay if a whale came in and pulled a lot of money out of the casino. It's okay if somebody hit the jackpot on the um, slot machines and made a bunch of money or someone got lucky on roulette. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter to the casino. What matters to the casino is that everything is in, in alignment with their long-term goals. We're going to talk more about long-term thinking in a moment, but for right now, the recency bias is basically where we overweight what's happening right now. We overweight um, our recent trade. So for example, here's a trade. Um, I didn't actually take this trade, but I took a similar one on the same day. And see where I've marked this daily candle on the New Zealand yen with a, a, a bearish um, arrow, right? So a down arrow, and then the market moved down. Now let's say that I, t I didn't take it on this pair. I think I actually took it on the Aussie or uh, maybe it was a yen or something. It was another pair that had a very similar setup. And let's say that I was expecting it to at least go down here to this line where the market bottomed out over here, okay? So I would have sold on uh, this candle, on this white candle, or um, yeah, I would have sold on that candle. I would have had about 110 pips of risk and you know only about 100 pips of reward here or maybe maybe i put my stop up here so i had about 90 pips of risk and so not quite at the end of the candle and i had about the same on the reward so it's about a one to one well the market never got there right the, ne the market never got there so if i had just taken this one trade which is called the belt trade by the way we should do a webinar just on this this belt trade because it's a great trade but we should We'll do that, and actually, I'll make, I'll make a note while I'm thinking of it that we'll do a belt trade webinar for people who are interested in that because it's people don't talk about the belt. I don't know why it's not a very commonly discussed pattern, but it's one of the ones that I that I like to trade. If I would have taken this and just said, you know what, these don't work. Look, this belt was too, you know, it, 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 it kept going up, the trend kept following up, and and it never really, although it went low. Although it went low, it didn't quite get to my support and resistance level. So I'm just going to adjust my trade. I'm just going to adjust my rules to the belt. So I'm going to change the system. When you think about that, that's crazy, right? Who changes the system because of one trade? Well, the fact is that um, novice traders do that all the time. They might have one, two, three, or five trades that have gone bad, and they'll start to change the rules and look at those losing trades and try and figure out what do they have in common and they'll add an, an additional rule or something like that and the problem with that of course as any mechanical trader will tell you is when you start adding more and more rules more and more um discretionary you, you what you're doing is you're adding you're removing degrees of freedom and basically what you're doing is you're you're essentially making it oh you're overfitting to the data and when the recency bias is involved you're overfitting to the recent um to the recent data, which is not necessarily the case that the market will always follow that. So the one thing that I will say about recency bias is we all have to guard against it. We all know that it happens, but a lot of times it seeps in and we're unaware of the fact that we're slowly changing our system based on what's happened in, in you know over recent trades. And the and the way to overcome recency bias, the way to the antidote for it, as it were, is essentially taking a long-term point of view, which means I have an agreement with myself as a trader that I will not look at trades in chunks of five or ten trades. I won't look at a system and judge the system or even judge the market for that matter, 
Because the other way, of course, of doing this is to say that the market's changed. That's another common one. Traders will say, well, the market's changed, so we can't do the system anymore because the markets are different now. Everything's changed now. Well, that's, that's not true. The markets have always been the same. They're, they become volatile or less volatile. They go in strong trends or they go directionless, and they go up or they go down, and that's it. And, and the markets will have always done that. They've always become volatile or less volatile. They've always trended up or trended down. They've always gone in directionless, sort of, you know, wandering around in consolidation. Um, they've had volatile trends and they've had low volatility trends. These are the sorts of things that we see happen all the time. So there really, really isn't any difference in the market. It's really the way that we perceive the market. And the recency bias is one of those filters that we use as humans to perceive the market in a way easy for us to give money back to the market. So when, when thinking about recency bias, my antidote for it is to simply look at trades in chunks of 30. Now you might choose 50 if you take more trades. I don't take as many trades because I use daily and weekly charts mostly. But if you're taking more like say, uh, you know, one hour or 15 minute trades, or you take a lot of trades per week, you might reassess your trades in chunks of 50 or 100. Maybe you take a lot of trades. Um, so what that means is when you reassess, and I don't really have time to go into this, but essentially I'll give you a hint. What you want to do is take a clue from the way that they, um, like on the assembly line. So if you think of like, let's say, um, uh, you know, like BMW, when they make their cars, they'll look at the parts that come off the assembly line and they'll check them to make sure that they fit within the range of acceptable um, size and everything so they'll that th it'll fit in the car when they put the car together so maybe like two millimeters slack that they have when that you know that that part has to be within two millimeters as a um, circumference or something like that right so and the reason why they do that and they'll they'll check that is because they don't want to have parts that don't fit and make a car with parts that aren't you know good enough well that's the same thing that a trader can do you can look at your trades over time and you can assess whether or not they fit within what you would expect to see. Now, how do you know what you would expect to see? Well, you've done, you've done your back testing. So many of you who follow me know that I am a big fan of Forex Tester. And I, to be honest, I don't know any traders at all who are good enough at trading who make consistent profits without using something like Forex Tester. And if you don't have it, I can give you an, a link here to get it um, at a discount. It's fxjake.com forward slash tester. That'll get you a discount, I think of 40 bucks or 50 bucks or something like that. And I do get a small commission if you do use my link. But if you use my link, um, you can email me and I'll give you a course on how to use it too. It's a little bit qu quirky if you haven't used it before. But if you have used it, um, and you're not using it now, why not, right? Why not get your numbers? Why not find out what your average winner, your average loser, and your win rate is? And based on all of those numbers, you can essentially assess whether or not a trade or a group of trades, like I said, a group of 30 trades, fits within what, what would be the expect, expected range. And that's how we know if, if a system's breaking down. That's how we know if the market's really going out and getting out of whack. In most cases, it's not the case. That's not what's happening. And, and we're just saying that's what's happening and that's how we see it because we're making a, a tactical error, really a psychological error because we've been built that way. So definitely look at your trades in chunks of 30. Does that make sense to everyone? Are there any questions about that? Yeah. Assess market base most yeah. So you don't want to you don't want to look at the most recent results. <clears throat> That's right. We look at chunks of trades. It's the same way that the casinos look at trade uh, uh, um, events. They'll look at chunks of events and if things get way out of whack they'll know. But if they're within the range, which could mean that they lose money for a day or two or a week even, uh, and then they'll get back on track and they know that they will, as long as it's within, within range. And so I'll give you an example of what would not be in range. Let's say that you have a, an expected win rate of 52% for your system. And over 100 trades, you look at it, and the, the, um, the win rate over 100 trades is 31%. In most cases, that would be out of range, in most cases. 
so so you would say okay something's going wrong it's probably and in most cases it's also user error in other words you're not executing correctly it's not it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that the market's changing more likely it has to do with your execution and maybe something's going on or maybe even um it could be your broker but more likely it's you um does that make sense everyone cool on number one recency bias okay cool so the the antidote for recency bias is to simply look at chunks of trades and not individual trades big chunks like 30 50 100 trades are those are the the units of measurement so you won't even consider doing anything adjusting anything about your trading until you see 30 50 or 100 trades depending on how free so i would say 30 if you trade like the daily charts like i do if you trade um lower time frames like you know the one hour whatever the four hour maybe you look at 50 and if you trade lower like if you take a lot of trades per week you could break it up into 100 trades um, that you're looking at as units of measurement to examine. And you want to compare whether or not the average winner is in line with what you would expect, if the win rate is in line with you, what you expect. Um, if you're using any sort of trailing exit, you want to see is the percentage of trades um, that that uh, go really well because the trailing exit has, has captured a big chunk, that those are also within the range of what, of what you expect over your historical live results and your backtesting results. Okay, cool. Now let's move on to the next one. Next one. <clears throat> I remember that big belt. I did take it, but the doji combined with the potential profit made me remove the trade for a small game. Big belts do work more than not. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Franz. That was awesome that you said that. I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah. So that helped. That happened on a lot of a lot of pairs that uh, that day. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Yeah, the belts do work well. Definitely more often than not. Okay, so I am going to go on to the next one. And the next one we have here is it's actually two that are very similar. We're going to lump these together. Hindsight bias and optimism bias. Hindsight bias and optimism bias. <clears throat> so hindsight bias sneaks in when we're looking at the charts and we scroll back and we say, oh, well, look at this. If we had done this every time this happened, whether it's an indicator, every time the stochastic crosses over 80, we would sell and blah, 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 and you know, these sorts of things. Um, we can scroll back on the charts. We can find plenty of opportunities to take those trades, right? because we're using hindsight bias. And we're saying this is a great trading system. Then of course we go live with it. And what ends up happening is it doesn't make money or doesn't do nearly as well as we had thought because we were only looking at the winners or we were downplaying the losers in our scrolling across the charts. Now, um, optimism bias is very similar, but not the same thing. And the antidote for these is the same, which is optimism bias is, uh, well, I wouldn't have done that. Like I wouldn't have taken that trade. So for example, let me just give you a quick one here. Um, what I'll do is I'll insert some uh, moving averages because that's a pretty common thing. We'll use the 11 just because no one ever does. And we'll use the uh like the 51 how's that sound 51 and the 11. And we'll make this one black okay so if we were to take these this chart and just scroll back um and say look you know if we had taken the cross here and put the stop loss above the swing high. Look at how far it would have gone, and we made all this money until it crossed here. You know that would have been good for. Um, that would have been good for. Three hundred twenty-eight pips, on the New Zealand yen, which is quite a bit. And same thing over here. If we had taken uh, this cross here, or crossed above here. 
that one would have been good for until it crossed below. So we're just taking a cross above, we buy, cross below, we sell. Uh, I think this one was um, worth 652 pips. So that's a great moving average cross example. You know, 300, 300 whatever, 350 pips, 650 pips on these. So you say, wow, this is a great system. Well, not really, because obviously there are plenty of crosses here where the market crossed right here, okay? So you're actually buying right here, which is almost on the, on the high. So you buy right here on the high, and then it falls and it stops you out. If you put your, your stop loss down here, you get stopped out maybe over here. Um, well, actually, maybe not, depending on where you put your stop. Uh, but essentially, you, and then you have another sell here. It crosses down here. Of course, when it crosses down here, we are um, going to sell, and it's really, really close to low. It doesn't really go much lower. It just goes higher, pulls back, and it would have stopped you out. If you had your stop loss here, you would have been stopped out over here. So, And then look at all these other crosses here. There's a cross, there's a cross, there's a cross, there's a cross. All of these are nightmares and would absolutely whipsaw you to death. <laughs> And, but instead, by using the recency bias, by looking at the last two, and using the hindsight and optimism bias, say, well, we wouldn't have gotten in those other ones because we knew that the market was choppy. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe not. So um, that's essentially what we would call the optimism or recency bias. And anyone who, um, thanks, Kadeem. Thanks for your comment. Awesome. Anyone who obviously has um, scrolled back and decided on a system based on what they see historically, You've seen this happen in action, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. So, what do we do for this? What's the what's the solution for the recency? Sorry, not the recency, the hindsight bias or the optimism bias. Well, it turns out there's a very simple solution, and that is to do this. write a trade journal so create a trade journal now i mean physically write it out not type it out not record a video all those things are great if you want to keep a journal of, of your trades but the most important thing that you can do is write it out and the reason why i say that is it activates a different area of your brain when you actually write it out um and you will learn it better if you write it out. So one thing that I would say is that um, when you write it out, you, you can want to keep the obvious, which is the price that you bought, the system that was that gave you the trigger, you know, the signal, um, how much, where the stop loss was, did you move it to break even and when and why, and did you split your position into multiple positions and take profit here, there, and there, or did you get stopped out altogether? Um, you can also write this in your journal. Rate the trade. So let's say that you like do an A, B, C, D, and F. So an A is an absolute winning trade. You know it's going to make money. You're absolutely sure. So you write an A. And then uh, an F is like, nah, not really. It looks really bad. Technically, it's a signal, but it really doesn't look good to me. And over time, what you can see now is whether or not your gut is correct. Now, in most cases, what you find is when you first start out as a trader, your gut is almost absolutely positively wrong. And as you go through time, you build up a gut because you've got all of this experience as a trader. You've seen all these charts. You, you start to understand the flow of the movement. you know. And, and, th and this is a pretty common where you'll see over time, you understand it when there's high tide and low tide. Even during an uptrend, there's going to be a low tide when the trend is going to um, weaken a bit, and that's the retracement move, right? So you'll get a sense for this over time. But if you keep this in your journal, you can look back and say, okay, over the last 500 trades, my A trades had a 51% win rate and my C trades have a 72% win rate. Why is that the case? That's because you're wrong. <laughs> your gut is wrong. So instead of relying on hindsight bias and optimism bias to fuel your systems, instead you have a real good trade journal. And you can write down your thoughts too, which is something that I should have mentioned before, which is, 
Not only are you going to put all the technical details of the trade, but your thoughts about the trade, your feelings about the trade, and then at the end, also write your feelings. So, so it's going to be when you take the trade, you write your thoughts during the trade, when you maybe you may move to break even or do something, and then finally at the end of the trade. Does that make sense to everyone? Is that cool? Let me know if there's any questions on the journal idea. But the trade journal is really critical to help you see the big picture. And to also, if you, if you keep those ratings of your trades, you will, you'll essentially have a record of how good your trader's gut is. If you have a record of how good your trader's gut is, now it's no more, it's no more guessing or hindsight bias or optimism bias. You have data now. You have data that you can use to identify whether or not you're doing um, well as a trader. It's very, very simple. Okay. All good? If that's good, we can move on to the next um, the next uh, problem, psychological mistake. All right, cool. So the next one that I want to talk about here is has kind of a weird name. There are many different ways, um, and it's too bad we weren't all of us weren't here in a in a group, because if there, if we were together in a you know at a long table or something, I could show you a really cool exercise in this so that you could see it you know, for, uh, you know, up close and in person. Um, but um, it's really good if you actually do an exercise and see this. But instead, um, uh, what we'll do is we'll just talk about it, <laughs> which is kind of kind of the way it goes, isn't it? So um, the next one I want to talk about here is called, we'll do this one in orange. Hyperbolic discounting. Now, what is hyperbolic discounting? Hyperbolic discounting. It sounds like something like you would get from your plumber, you know? Your plumber comes in and says, you know, uh, this is the third time you've uh, you've rung this this uh, this month with a with a, a leaky uh, a leaky toilet. Your toilet doesn't seem to shut off. So we're going to give you a hyperbolic discount, you know? It sounds like something like that, doesn't it? It doesn't really sound like a trading term or even really a psychology term. It sounds like a math term. Like, yeah, math, like a math, like, yeah, what we need to do here for this equation is we need to pull in some hyperbolic discounting and then we can solve it. You know, it doesn't make sense, does it? Well, hyperbolic discounting, it turns out, is when you put too much on, It's this is talking about time, okay? It's all about time when you're talking about hyperbolic discounting. Um, it means that you have essentially what's called temporal myopia or short-sightedness when it comes to time. And essentially, um, the clarity and perception of the future. So uh, as a trader, how we see, how you see, how clear you see the future and how you perceive the future, that clarity and that um, the, va the validity of your perception decreases as you look further into the future. In other words, people are really, really bad at looking into the future, especially when it's the further future. And so what they do is they say, a bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. And so this is the whole idea of scalping. In most cases, scalpers, which you know, you can go back and watch the other webinars about um, scalping on your brain, and here is scalping on your brain. We have all that stuff archived for you. You can see what is scalping like for your brain, which could be surprising for some people. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I don't like trading the lower time frames because I don't like to activate the cocaine area of my brain. But anyway, you can go back and, and watch that one if that's interesting to you. With hyperbolic discounting, the scalper says, look, I'm going to take these three pips now rather than slap a trailing exit on my position and maybe get 30 pips later much much later because i know that i can get my three pips now and i can make three pips in, in, a, in a you know 90 seconds worth of work whereas if i were to um look at um you know trying to make more and making you know 25 35 pips 
by holding on to this position into the future, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. And so oftentimes people will take what they have now. It's the old bird in the hand thing. That's where it came from because they don't know what's going to happen in the future. Now, of course, they don't know what's going to happen in the future, but the, that the, um, the issue is the future is actually worth more to you because the future could keep going. And, does, and here's a question for everyone here. Does the market really care where you got into your position? Does it really matter if, for example, on this chart right here, I'm going to zoom out. Um, actually, I want to zoom way out. Let's see if we can find something exciting. Yeah, here, here we go. I want to I want to zoom way out and just see what this looks like. One second. Okay, yeah. Here we go. Here we go. Does the market really care if I bought all the way down here? So I bought down here, and currently my trade is up 1,700, no, 1,793 pips, okay? Because I bought down there on that bullish candle. Does the market really care that I got in back there? No. Is your broker going to spike you down, you know, put a spike through here to stop you out or something? No. That's not going to happen. But we tend to think as traders that it does matter uh, where we got in and it affects our decision making. And so hyperbolic discounting is when you take a bird in the hand rather than waiting for two in the bush. And it's terrible. And we've all been through it. We all know what it's like. One of the worst pains for traders um, is typically watching a trade go without you, a trade that you got into, a trade that you had analyzed and thought that's a good trade, a trade that your system said, take that trade and you took it, but you got out too early and you watched it go. It's an absolute heartbreaker. It's gut-wrenching and a lot of traders can't withstand that. Um, it drives them crazy. So um, that's why using trailing exits or at the very least splitting your position can work, right? Splitting your position can definitely work by looking at your, um, so here, here's one solution that you could do here. Let's say, for so in most cases, if you took a trade, so the way that I trade is I trade off support and resistance, right? So trading off support and resistance means that I have to identify um, where I think the market's gonna go. And I say, yeah, the market's probably gonna go that far and then it, then it may turn around, right? So uh, that's fine. Understanding that, that's fine. Everyone you know, probably understands that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You think the market's going to go from one area down to the next and it's going to bounce off that. So that's support and resistance trading. It's as old as the hills, right? So there's no, nothing really groundbreaking about that. However, what happens when the market really goes without you? And instead of going to the next area of resistance, it goes through that one. And instead of going to the next area of resistance, it goes through that one and it keeps going. Well, in those cases, those rare cases, you actually wish that you had a trailing exit in because you probably would have locked in more profit than you had by just going for the next two support resistance levels. In other words, if you take a trade and you go, okay, I've got 80 pips of risk on my trade. I'll shoot for 100 pips at my first target and I'll split my trade into two positions. And my second one, I'll go for 160 pips. So the first trade is a little bit better than one to one reward to risk ratio. And the second one's two to one. And the problem is if that trade goes nine to one, I'm kicking myself going, why did I do that? Well, it makes a lot of sense. This is something I learned from a, one of my students actually who manages a head fu hedge fund. Um, he's done a couple now. He basically decided that, look, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to split my positions up and I'm going to have a, an easy target, a further target. Um, hopefully most of the time my easy target will be hit. My further target will be hit occasionally and then I'll have a trailing exit too. And that will also allow me to take advantage of those trades where the market really, really goes. So if you had, for example, 1% that you risk per trade, you'd split it into thirds. 33% on target one, which is a one-to-one -one target, risking $100 to make $100, or risking 1,000 euros to make 1,000 euros. In the next trade, I'm risking 1,000 euros to make 2,000 euros because that's a two-to-one target. And then finally, I've got a trailing exit. Now, a lot of times, the best possible result isn't going to end up being your two-to-one if the trade goes in your favor. But sometimes, occasionally, that trailing exit will end up being an eight to one, or a seven to one, or a nine to one, or a 10 to one. And that's really gonna add to your bottom line over time. You just have to capture enough of those, and you will get enough of those over time. So that's essentially um, one way to deal with hyperbolic discounting, by allowing yourself to do kind of both things. Take quick profits and manage 
the trade so that it, it if it, if it goes in your favor, you're in a good position to take advantage of that. Does that make sense to everyone? Is that uh, pretty clear? Can we see if big institutions build up positions in a range of time? Um, the the best um, the um, you can look in the U.S. There is some good U.S. data on that, if that's what you're talking about, um, which is essentially when you see um, it's the uh, commitment of traders report. Now, you want to pay attention to the institutions and not the uh, retail traders. But basically, you can see, for example, on futures, you can see how committed are um, Euro futures traders, things like that. That's what you can get out of the U.S. Those are U.S. traders only, though. So you can get that data. Um, I find it more interesting to go to the retail traders because we are, uh, most of you, I think probably, I almost want to say all of you, are in the retail world. You're trading with a retail Forex broker. Um, if that's the case, you're taking money from other traders. If you make money at, consistently as a trader, the money's coming from other traders. That's who you're teaching a lesson to, and you shouldn't feel bad about that. That's how it works. They lose money and you gain money, right? Your broker's making money. Don't you have to worry about them. <laughs> uh, they're, they're definitely doing all right. So um, what I do is I look, if you go to fxjake.com forward slash crowd, you can see what the crowd is doing. That's going to redirect you to a page where you can see the... Um, well, my chart just lost um my chart just lost data i just want to make sure i didn't lose you okay i'm in holidays in italy and i don't know if the internet's going to stay but look it's italy uh, the internet's been really good so okay so yeah so i just wanted to make that really clear that um that look as a trader you don't have to you don't have to commit to one thing you don't have to only take uh, one to one targets or two to one targets or whatever you can split it up spread your bets and actually wait and see over the long haul if that makes sense to you it's okay for your trailing exit to win occasionally it's okay for your one to one to hit often and it's okay for your two to one to hit somewhat somewhat consistently as well so what you might do in that case is if you have say you're using two percent risk you might risk i don't know what it is uh, 0 0.63 percent or something like that is that right? 0.66% or something like that. Um, and you would have three positions. One is a one-to-one, -one, one is a two-to-one, and one is a trailing exit. And with that, over time, you can see, okay, well, is this making sense to me or do I need to adjust? So over like maybe two, three, 400 trades, you say, okay, well, the trailing exit really made money, uh, you know, 10% of the time or 7% of the time, and it's worth it to me to have that on there. Now, a lot of times what will happen is if the trade goes strongly in your favor, the two to one's probably going to be your best trade um, because your trailing exit will get will get stopped out in a pullback, you know, sometimes after it hits two to one. But it depends on you as a trader and on, depends on which time frame you trade and all that. It really depends. So are there any charts that you guys want to see? If there are any charts that you want to see, now's the time to do it. We're kind of getting to the end of the webinar. I'm happy to look at any current charts uh from uh from a naked point of view i'm going to delete these moving averages because i don't like to have indicators on my chart and then i'm going to move over to some of the charts that i've been watching lately again like i said i'm on holiday but i still have been watching the um swissy so okay so i didn't see this so the swissy actually did make a bounce off this level. So I had uh, determined that this was an area I'd be looking for a sell or this one up here on the Swissy. Now, for those of you that are wondering, you can't see the chart because it's not clear enough. That's roughly 98.09 as a sell level up there, which it just wicked into. And then there was another one here at 97.70. I'm sorry, 97.75 and 98.09 or so. But the big one would be up here if it went up to 98.58 and printed a bearish candle. That would be a great spot for sales. So the Swissy is one that I'm definitely watching. Another one that I'll say, um, yen. Yeah, this is the other one. The yen did this big, um, um, 
this big bearish candle here. I said it's probably going to retrace back up, and it did. It retraced right back up to the zone right there, um, which was clearly identified over here, and it pulled down. So I'm looking for the yen actually to fall probably down to 109.30 or 109.40, and maybe even down here to 108.55 or so. When I say fall, I mean the US dollar fall, obviously, not the yen, right? This one's kind of a mess. It's in a really, it's in a consolidation box, I would call the Euro Aussie. So that's a four hour Euro Aussie. I would just call it a consolidation box. Yeah. Okay, here's another one the pound. Okay. So pound New Zealand. This is very similar to what we're talking about on the yen, right? That was the yen. Yeah. So as far as the pound New Zealand, I like this idea of, okay, I lost it. <laughs> Where is it? Oh, that's not it. Where is my pound New Zealand? There it is. This one, right? Yeah. Okay. I really like this idea of a pullback up to this zone and then selling it off 1.8310. I think if it comes up here and it prints a nice big bearish candle on the daily, that would be a lovely trade to sell. And one of the reasons why I like it so much is it's probably going to go at least down to 79.90, which we'll call 1.80, which is going to be good for, you know, roughly um, from 83, let's say it's down to 80 to 70. So, you know, that's good for 260 pips or so, probably at least. And then there's another one down here at 1.78, right? Another level of potential profit target. And then there's one all the way down here, 1.7530. So a lot of uh, possible uh, uh, zones for that one. Can we have a look at the pound and gold? Let's have a look at the pound and gold. So pound is right here. There's my pound. Okay, so this one's a bit wonky. Let me go to the other pound chart, which should be here. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to just go ahead and delete everything because I want to look at the daily. Delete all my zones. And then we'll look at. Um, okay, so here's the the best the best um, the best way for me to fit this into a box, so to speak, would be to go like this. So I would put a trend line right here on the pound, and then you would go something like this. What you want is what I, what I would be looking for here is a. is a retouch of this trend line. It's not perfect, is it? Boy, it's close though. So if the pound is still bearish, what, in other words, it's ripe for a sell, if that's the case, then it will probably come back up here and touch this, um, touch this trend line, or there's another thing it could do. If it doesn't do that, if it just kind of languishes in here and keeps going around and around like that, kind of like the Euro Aussie was, and I'll show you that in a moment so you, you know what I'm talking about, then it's then I would say it's just consolidating in a box, this big fat box here. Okay? If it keeps languishing here and just kind of doesn't really, just meanders, but if it comes back up here and touches either this trend line and, with a bearish candle or it comes up and touches right here, this 2976 level, with the bearish candle, then I would say, yeah, let's, you know, that's another reason for me to short it. Um, and w as far as targets, I would go with something like this one makes sense. Um, let me show you this one really quick. So I'm not really doing much other than just saying, look, this is a um, this is a drop. It's going to drop off this trend line and go. It's a drop trade, what we call that. Okay. Now let me let me hook into that daily again, and I'll show you. Then we'll be done with this one. Okay. So it's been following this trend line. Now the the alternative theory, of course, is like I said. 
this is a this is a consolidation box because it's been bouncing around and if it comes back up here and you know comes back up to this box and then falls back down if it doesn't move out of this really what it should do is this the, the, the easiest way to think of this is this it should go like this it should go up hit this and then immediately go down like that out of the box and then it might pull back and hit it and then go down again but the point is it should be headed to this target down here if instead it goes up here and then comes down and goes up and down and up and then like that and keeps going then we know it's in a box and that's what i was talking about when i was referring to the euro aussie which we were looking at earlier i think it was this one yeah this was a similar thing where i said look if it breaks this little trend line here it's probably going to fall it was squeezing up against this horizontal level and if it, if it breaks and it will fall all the way down to you know down to these lows or whatever it didn't do that it just kind of stood there so now what we're talking about is a consolidation with this one it's very very obvious right and now we'll move on to gold so now we have to wait for it to break out of that box and it's a last kiss if it gets out of that box um gold right so i had this trend line on gold um, I consider it in the in the midst of kind of like an up up move now. I wouldn't really do anything other than look for buys. So uh, maybe a, a bullish, a big bullish candle to re-engage here. But to me, this is this is an up move consolidation. It's going to go up again, most likely, until it until it gets up here. We probably don't know which is the twelve ninety level. Until it gets to twelve ninety, we probably don't know what what it, what the I, what it wants to do really, as I see it. So, all this is here is a consolidation in the midst of an up move, really. And once it gets close to twelve ninety, then we'll know if it wants to keep going higher or if it's going to pull back and come back to the trend line. Basically, does that make sense? You all cool with that? All right. Well, hey guys, thanks so much for spending time here today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for spending time here at the Naked Trading webinar. I hope to see you at the next one. Um, and like I said, you know, um, journal, so just to re rehash here, look at your trades in big chunks of 30, 50, or 100 trades. Journaling with a trade rating can help you. And um, splitting up your exit strategies for your positions as well. So making making a single trade idea into multiple trades by you know not by adding risk but by just adding different exit strategies can also help you quite a bit psychologically i hope that that makes sense i wish you guys had very happy trading and thank you so much for your time thanks so much to you watching the recording as well thanks guys we'll see you next time bye